this evening. Please stand with me. And let's begin by praising the Lord and saying, Jesus set me free. Why should I be bound? Jesus set me free.
sing, Holy is the Lord and mighty is his name.
the first hymn that we sang, which is right there off the page 195, Trust and Obey, and then we're going to focus on the cleansing power of the Lord and how important that is, but I thought, let us sing together, Cleanse Me, O Lord, number 190. So that we are never 
um, thinking that this is just some person's idea. Uh, far from it. We want to always be preaching and sharing the Word of God and asking the Lord, what is your idea? What is your will for each and every one of us? So, as I said at the outset, um, we're going to look a little bit at trusting, but more so at trusting the Lord for the cleansing. Um, and to examine once again, what happens when we don't do what God is commanding us to do? Now notice I used the word commanding. I didn't say what God is asking us to do. It is in fact a command when the Lord says to his children, this is what you must do. Okay, I don't see that as a request. I see that as a requirement. And one of the first things that we have to establish in all of our hearts and our minds and our, in our spirit is that we trust the Lord completely. We have to rest completely in his arms. We have to have the faith that allows us to uh, put aside all these other things that the world might be saying, what even other Christians might be saying, so-called. And we have to always come back, what is the Lord saying? So there is a, a trusting involved, but we know from the, uh, the song, the hymn that we sang, there's a trusting that's linked very closely to an obeying. And uh, so it says in Jeremiah chapter 11, let me just start reading at verse 2. Jeremiah 11, hear ye the words of this covenant, and speak unto the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And say thou unto them, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice, and do them according to all which I command you, so shall ye be my people, and I will be your God, that I may perform the oath which I have sworn unto your fathers to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, as it is this day, then answered I and said, So be it, O Lord. So we see a couple really important things connected together there. First of all, that it is the Lord who is speaking. He uses Jeremiah, but it is God's words that Jeremiah is then to communicate and share with the rest of the people. You'll notice then, or at least I want to point out, because I noticed, that God starts off with the curse. Very often we uh, focus on the blessing piece, but not so much on the curse. And it's interesting to me that in this particular example, God doesn't always do it this way, but in this particular example, he started with the curse. He started with the negative. And it's very clear, cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant. And so uh, there isn't, you know, the world likes to try and, and find escape clauses. You know, they look for a way out of everything. Um, is there an easier way that we can do this and still get away with it? And when it comes to the word of the Lord, there is no easy way to get away with it. You don't get away with it. And so as God's people, we have to accept the fact that when the Lord says uh, something, that it is yea and amen for all of us. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, what your life situation happens to be. When the Lord says it, he's applying it to everyone. And when we say we are his children and we are Christians, then absolutely we have to look at what God says. So the Lord made it very clear, those that don't obey the covenant, and the covenant was simple in one sense, with regards to the promise uh, of bringing the people out and providing with them a promised land, which, uh, as we see here in the scripture, is described as flowing with milk and honey. So a wonderful place, right? God made that promise. But within that covenant, there are, of course, all of the commandments, there are all of the lifestyle requirements that all go along with the promise. Okay? And so... God, uh, in his mercy, really, 
uh, provides the people with this opportunity. He says, you know, you can have all of these blessings, but you have to obey. You have to do what I'm telling you to do. Now, for us, for God's people, that's not a surprise. That's not a word of revelation or anything like that. You know that, and I know that. But we have to do more than know it. We have to live it each and every day. There are all kinds of things that I know up in my head that don't necessarily translate into behaviors, don't necessarily translate into the actions that are required. And so as God's people, I would encourage you to do more than just know, but we have to act, we have to live what we say we know. And we have to be active in following what the, God, what the Lord tells us to do. And so, you know, we, we need this deeper understanding of God's commands. Now, one of the places that we sometimes get in trouble, I think, and it's one of the ways that Satan um, creates difficulties, is that we take a look at what God commands, and because by nature, carnal nature, uh, people want to find the easier road, want to look for uh, what's the minimum thing I can do and still pass. Did you ever, you know, in school, did you know kids like that? Or maybe once in a while that was you or me, right? You know, the, we knew that we could get a higher grade, but we sort of convinced ourselves that wasn't that important. So, you know, I, I want to pass, so what's the minimum? What is the minimum that I can do? And sometimes what Christians will do is they'll look at the word of the Lord and they start to try and negotiate in their own mind, what's the minimum that I can do to follow what God has told me? And that sometimes leads to various opinions, okay? So for instance, like we live in a, a world today, much like the world that Jesus was in, it's I think always been this way, um, where people have various opinions. So if I say to a group of Christians, what does it mean to live holy? It may surprise you that you're going to get a variety of opinions. Okay? And rather than go to the word of the Lord and sift through and look carefully at what God says is holiness, people start to try and define it themselves. And generally speaking, we try and take the definition that God has given and we make it easier for us to accomplish it. In a sense, we water down the standards that God has provided. Always looking for the easy road. Always looking for the minimum that we can do in order to, you know, hopefully uh, you know, get into heaven uh, but we don't want to give up too much. And, and that attitude leads to a great deal of trouble. Okay? It's what leads to uh, disagreements in the church uh, or between churches and between denominations. It's really what has created all the various Christian denominations and sub-denominations and you name it. All because people are, are interpreting the word of the Lord and God's commandments often to suit and fit their own desire. I want to do this, so I'm going to massage this command so that it fits my lifestyle, and then I can still say that I'm a Christian. That's not a wise thing to do. And I have to fight against that, and, and I believe all of us, at some point in time, we have to fight against that, because, you see, it's always easy for us to accept uh, the commands that don't have a big impact on us necessarily, okay? You know, so, you know, if, if you're not prone to stealing, then the commandment about not stealing, it's no big deal, right? But other people that, that maybe have a difficulty with that, that's going to be a challenge for them. What I'm trying to say is that, you know, sometimes there are, are covenants, there are commandments 
that we don't think much about because they don't impact us directly or we don't have a challenge with that particular area and Satan hasn't come in that way, whereas other people might find it more challenging. So different opinions start to arise and, and that creates um, disagreements and division. And we don't want division. We've been talking about that a little bit during the week. So when it comes to the truth, one of the things that the Lord speaks about, uh, and he tells us to do many, many things, um, is to cleanse or to purge. Okay? And I thought I would look at this because I was reading, we're going to take a look in the Old Testament, um, at a portion of this covenant that Jeremiah refers to here. And God told his children at the time, that there were certain things that they were supposed to do when they came into what would become their promised land. Now, it wasn't like the land was vacant. Right? We have to understand there were all kinds of other people around, other um, you know, nationalities with their own religious beliefs, etc. And so the best land was always coveted. In other words, everybody wanted the best land. Right? I mean, you know, if you're living on a rock that you can't grow anything on, and down a little bit further down the road or, or whatever is this wonderful field that nobody appear, appears to be in possession of, in those days, then you would go and you would put up a fence or you would claim it as yours because it was worth more than the rocky land that you were on before. So when God promises the children of Israel this land flowing with milk and honey, it wasn't just empty land waiting for them. There were people already there. And God gave very specific instructions. He told them exactly what to do about that. And in a nutshell, he told them to cleanse the land. He told them to clean it up. Because what was there would have a negative impact on them as they came in. So I was thinking about this concept of cleaning or cleansing. And I thought, you know, I'm sure that within the church, or within the congregation, or just any group of people, you know, if I said to them, like, define what is clean. Or tell me what's involved with cleaning? And we will probably find some similarities in our definition, but the degree to which we might do something varies. So, example, okay? So if I tell you, oh, I'm noticing here, I'm not, but I'm noticing here the communion table needs cleaning. So I grab a Kleenex, you know, interesting that it's called a Kleenex. But anyway, not spelled that way. But I grab a Kleenex and I, and I do this. Okay, now it's clean. And some people might say, oh, what? You didn't clean anything. Right? Whereas I, I, I sort of cleaned. I thought I cleaned. Some people, that's how they clean. Right? So now, isn't the table clean? And people would say, well, obviously it's not clean. Right? Because you didn't really, you know, use the proper equipment and you didn't move things, you know, to lift and you didn't move things around to see. And if we're really going to clean this lovely uh, green, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, we're probably going to have to maybe put hand wash it or I don't know, we probably wouldn't throw it into a washing machine. But, you know, there's a little more effort involved than taking a cloth and just do, 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 and then say it's clean. Okay. I want you to stop and think though, and it's sort of you were some of you were smiling when I did my little cleaning, and you probably wouldn't hire me to come now and clean your house, right? Especially if that's how I'm gonna do it. But there are Christians who when they look at the scripture and God says that you have to clean something or clean yourself. They want to say, doo, 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 doo. oh, I'm all done. I'm clean. Okay? Where 
what God was saying was completely something to a far greater degree, right? I mean, we would all agree that cleaning involves more than what I just did up here, right? Mm -hmm. And so my point this evening is for us to consider how important it is to um, look at what God instructs us to do. And when the scripture talks about us doing things wholeheartedly and completely as unto the Lord, I think we have to understand that in order for something, and in particular a person, to be completely cleansed, it's going to take God's presence to do it. Are you with me on that one? Right? You see, even this table, let's say you're a really good cleaner. I would challenge you to get something completely clean. I don't think in this world, I mean, if we look at it almost on a microscopic level, there's absolutely, I don't think there's a way for you to absolutely wipe out every germ, every bacteria, every little spot of dirt, because we know it's floating around in the world all around us. So the minute I'm finished cleaning, I walk away, it's already dirty again. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that to discourage you, keep cleaning. Really, what we have to do is look at that and say, wow, that means I need to make a greater effort to constantly work at that cleansing that God is talking about. Okay? It's not to say, well, I think Pastor Roger said there's no way we can be clean, so what's the point? No, 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 no. It's completely the opposite is the point I'm trying to make. If there's no way that we can be completely clean, all right, until the day calls me home, the Lord calls me home that day, all right, on that day, I believe I will be completely cleansed, all right, but until that day, sin is constantly trying to cleave to me, right, you know, my garment, though it might be white as snow when the Lord cleanses me, Satan is always right there trying to put spots on it again. That's, of course, why we come to Him daily for forgiveness. Right? That's why we have to come to Him every day and say, Lord, forgive me my trespasses, as Jesus prayed. Because Jesus recognized there was no way, absolutely no way, to be 100% perfect while we're here. We can't be completely clean. But we do have to keep striving. And the way that we strive to achieve that cleansing or that cleanness is by doing our very, very best to follow the instructions that God has given us. Okay? So there's the trusting and there's the obeying and the doing to the fullest of our power and ability to do what God has asked us to do. If we don't, then we cannot receive the blessing. Sometimes doing what God has asked us to do is difficult. Because it might go against what we think emotionally is the right thing to do. Or what we even think sometimes intellectually is the right thing to do. But if God says do it, it needs to be completely so in Exodus, let's look at an example. Maybe you'll sort of see where I was going with this as I was reading. In Exodus chapter 34, in Exodus 34, starting at verse 10, okay, Exodus 34 and verse 10, here's a covenant. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people I will do marvels, such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do 
with thee. Now, the, when it talks about terrible there, it's just talking about powerful and amazing and mighty. Okay? Verse 11. Observe thou that which I command thee this day. And so that means to obey. That means to do. Behold, I will drive out before thee the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice. And thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a whoring after their gods. So stop there. So the Lord was very clear, right? He was very clear, I'm going to go in, I'm going to drive these people out, but you must not make any covenant with these people. Now, some people would have probably said, and actually what we're going to read next, is the fact that they did not obey. Okay. Perhaps they thought that was too harsh. Perhaps they thought, wait a minute, this is a great resource. We can use all of these people to our benefit. And that's actually what they ended up doing. Okay? But in doing so, they were not cleansing, they were not obeying the way the Lord expected His people to obey. Now it's easy for me to point my fingers at them, but the tougher part is of course for us now to look at our lives. We have to understand that the Lord still has commandments that you and I, we need to follow. Right? There are covenants, there are things in the scripture, even this particular covenant, which talks about how important it is, really, to maintain separation. Now that doesn't mean I'm going to build a wall around my house or anything like that, but it means in my behaviors, in my attitudes, absolutely in my beliefs, in my moral standards, all of these things, there needs to be a separation. And God made it very clear, right, that if you don't maintain the separation, by and by, there's going to be intermingling, and soon the world's going to, you know, a little thing here and a little thing there. And that's certainly what we've seen. We've seen it historically, and I believe we see it today, where the attitudes, the processes, the symbols, um, the moral standards of the world slowly but surely have crept into what is now considered to be Christian. And even if we're not careful, if I'm not careful and you're not careful, it will creep into you and it will creep into me. That's a danger. That's a big, big danger. But it only can happen if we allow the enemy to maintain a foothold in our lives, in our churches. It can only happen if we stray from the path that the Lord has told us to follow. We're not much different than little children. I'm not trying to offend you. I'm trying to draw a comparison. Right? Because children are renowned for receiving instruction and then trying to figure out how they can get away with sort of following but not really following the instruction. And you've probably done that as a child, right? You look at what it says to do and then, eh, I don't really have to do that. Actually, I know a whole bunch of uh, ministers 
who are pretty good at that. I've sort of done that myself at times. For our ministering, our fellowship, every year we're requested to send in a renewal form. Okay? It's just one page. It's not that complicated. And it asks the same questions every year. And a lot of ministers have decided, this is foolish. I don't need to send this back in because nothing has changed. Now stop and just think about that for a second. Okay. They've rationalized in their own mind they don't need to do what's required. Yes, granted, it's just a human man-made sort of requirement or a committee requirement. I get that. All right. But that attitude is dangerous. Because the danger is that by and by we can start to do the same thing with regards to the word of the Lord. We can start to say in our own mind, why do I need to do that? Or, as we've been sort of hearing, and it's very true, people will start to say, why do I need to go to church? I don't need to go to church. Okay? Because by and by, they've come to a place where they're kind of rationalizing that in their own mind, forgetting what the Scripture says. And so we can all, I'm trying to just point out that we can all slip a little bit. And the danger is that we allow that slipping to continue rather than coming to the Lord, asking for forgiveness, and making sure that we do what God tells us to do. Now with my natural example, my attitude is, if the world asks me to do something, and I don't think it's a great idea, that I need to get the idea changed. That's what I used to say to kids all the time at my school. I said, if you don't like it, until it changes, you're still going to do it. I don't care whether you like it or not. Okay? And then if you can get enough power together and whatever and change it officially, then fine. Then it'll be changed. But in the meantime, it hasn't changed. Now, when it comes to spiritual things, God's not going to change. And so we need to accept that we must do completely what the Lord asked us to do. So here God provided some instruction, right? Turn with me now to Judges chapter 1. I just want to show you what happened in this particular case. These were God's people. These were people that were blessed by the Lord, and God brought them out, and He brought them into the promised land. He did, God did exactly what He said He was going to do. He kept His part of the covenant. But the downfall <clears throat> is never in God's part of the covenant, it's in people's part. Now, I'm not going to read all of this, mostly because there are so many interesting names here that I'm bound to stumble over and over and over again. But I do want you to see what's happening. So I'm going to start in the first uh, chapter of Judges. Start, look down at about verse 25. Okay? Judges 25. So there was a little bit of a deal that was made here. Actually, go back to 24. And the spies saw a man come forth out of the city, and they said unto him, Show us, we pray thee, the entrance into the city, and we will show thee mercy. So there's some negotiation going on there. And when he showed them the entrance into the city, they smote the city with the edge of the sword, but they let go the man and all his family. And the man went into the land of the Hittites and built a city and called the name thereof Luz, in which is the name there unto, uh, unto this day. So if you get the image, they let somebody go, he started a city, etc., the part that's interesting, though, here, is that became a trend. And we know how trends happen in society. Okay? And we are influenced by one another. And we want to always positively influence each other in a Christian manner. However, out there in the world, there's completely the opposite. And so what you see here, starting in verse 27, right? Neither did men, uh, Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of um, Beth Shean and her towns, nor Tanach and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, nor the inhabitants of 
Ibleum and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. And it came to pass, when Israel was strong, that they put the Canaanites to tribute, and did not utterly drive them out. Okay? And when you keep reading the next verses, notice they all start with, neither did, verse 29, 30, neither did. And verse 31, neither did. Verse 32, but the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites. Verse 33, neither did. The trend here became, wait a minute, we don't have to do what God tells us what we need to do. We're just going to do it our way. And we're going to basically make these Canaanites slaves. Or we're going to do like the Romans would eventually do to the Israelites in the future, they would get them to pay tribute. Okay, so in this sense, I suppose they weren't any better than the Romans. Uh, they just turned uh, all of these other nations into their sort of slave states, and they kept them alive. They would have allowed them to do their own thing, have their own religion, all of that kind of thing, as long as they continue to pay tribute. Sounds great, but it's not what God told them to do. See, very often, we convince ourselves, this sounds good, what we're going to do, and it kind of fits in with what God said. You know, God probably didn't mean this, you know, he didn't mean that much. Right? And we rationalize, we start talking. And if I keep talking that way, I can guarantee you 100%, I will eventually find somebody who agrees with me. And then I feel good. Whoa, now there are two of us that think the same thing. Now we start talking, and then we find somebody else, then there's three, then there's four. But through all of our talking, we forgot what God said. That's the critical point. Okay? The critical point is you can talk, and I can talk, and you can think, and I can think, but ultimately, before we act, we better always come back to the Lord. And make sure we are lining up to his standard, to his measuring stick. Doing what the Lord told us to do. Now, it had been years since God made the covenant, but he didn't change it. And God didn't forget it. So it was up to the people to stay steadfast and be strong in the word of the Lord. And this is what we really have to do today, in society today. Because you will have Christian friends who will look at the Bible, whatever version they've got, might even be the same one that you have, and they will say, that's not what God meant. And then we have to look at what the Lord says, study the entire word of God, and then my strong suggestion is always to take the safest route. Don't play around on the edge of the cliff. Don't play around with, ah, this will be good enough. You know, I could come in and I could clean, clean your house like I cleaned that front table. And I could say to you, hey, that's good enough. What's your problem? And I'll call you some funny name or whatever. And that's what the world does to us today. Because they don't want the high standard. They want you, they want the church as such to lower the standard. You don't have to live that way to be saved. You don't have to live that way to go to heaven. Come on, get with it. What are you, from some other like planet or what? No, I'm a Christian who believes that what the Lord says is yea and amen. Okay? And God didn't tell them to do what they're doing here in these verses in Judges. The most critical part is that God doesn't overlook these things. Okay? He might let you live in a contrary fashion for a while to give you opportunity to change your way, but eventually it's going to catch up. We can use that example naturally about foods you eat, about things I like to eat, and I can say, hey, 
I can eat this, I feel just fine. Maybe for a year, maybe for two, maybe for 30 years. Okay? But one day, you might not feel fine. And the doctor comes and says, oopsie, look at this, this problem, da 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 Boy, you've been doing that for 30 years, guess what? It just caught up to you. Okay? And now we have a big problem. And spiritually, I don't want to get into that problem. And neither should you want to get into that problem. So we have to take the sure road. Okay? In chapter 2, let me just read quickly. What's the outcome when we don't do what God tells us to do? And an angel of the Lord, verse 1, came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you to go up out of Egypt. And it brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. See, God never breaks his covenant with us. Verse 2. And ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars. But ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have ye done this? Interesting that the angel of the Lord asked that question. Verse 3, Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass, when the angel of the Lord spake these things, or words, unto all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voices and wept. But it does not tell me that God changed his plan. Okay. There's a price to pay. And when the Lord says cleanse, or the Lord says live holy, or the Lord says touch not the unclean thing, or the Lord says don't do what the world says, do what I say. If I paraphrase all those commandments, right? You and I, we need to be determined with all the strength and fortitude that God can give us and all the help that God is willing to give us, that we will do our very best every day, not to try and get away with as little as possible, but to do as much as possible to follow the word of the Lord every day. And I have to examine myself. And I encourage you to examine yourself. Because the areas in which the enemy might be trying to get you to change a little bit, or me to change a little bit, they're not necessarily the same. God knows, and the Satan knows, where he can try and get in. Right? Into my life, into your life, whatever it might happen to be. You know, I have no desire whatsoever to smoke. I have no desire whatsoever to take any drugs that might cause me an addiction? Guess I'm blessed that way. No cravings for alcohol or anything like that. So those are not temptations that bother me. But there are many other kinds of temptations. And I have to constantly ask the Lord to maintain His standard so that I don't start rationalizing and saying, oh, Maybe a little bit is okay. Or I can do that once in a while. The problem isn't... Well, it is. The problem is the once in a while, but the problem is once in a while becomes more often. And then more often again. And more often again. I suppose what I'm describing is backsliding. It doesn't all happen overnight. It's little by little by little. Because Satan has gotten in, and people have decided... I can just clean a little bit. I don't have to do it wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly means work. And following the Lord means work. Stand with me. Let me close. As I um, look into the scripture myself, I find that I am constantly falling short. That shouldn't be a surprise, 
But I think it's also another one of those things that I feel is important for us to acknowledge. I can't do this by myself. I just can't. I'm not strong enough. I'm not wise enough. I can't see into the future. I'm full of fault and failure. Now, I don't want that to become an excuse for more fault or failure, but it needs to become, in a sense, a battle cry. It needs to become a push where I then acknowledge I need more of God. I need more of the Holy Spirit. I need more of the Savior. Because I cannot do this on my own. But I'm not going to lower the standard. Listen to that carefully. Okay? I'm not going to lower the standard so I feel good. I'm going to ask God to strengthen me and lead me and guide me and lift me up so that I can keep pushing towards the standard. Not drop it down, but keep it high and lift it up. So when the Lord says cleanse, I recognize only God's Spirit can cleanse me. Only God's Spirit can keep me clean. And it's only through Him that I'm able to continually do what the Lord asks of me to do. Tonight as we pray, my prayer is that you would acknowledge that as well, recognize that as well, that to trust and obey is more than just two words or three words, trust and obey, but it is something that requires the help of the Holy Spirit and that every day I need to ask God for that so that I can do what He's asking me to do. It's not just a simple little job. It has to be a deep cleansing, a deep cleaning, a deep following of the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, tonight <coughs> I come to you, dear Lord Jesus, before members of the congregation who stand here before you. Here we are. And I pray, dear Lord God, that you would see our hearts. I pray, dear Lord Jesus, you would see our mind and that we would first and foremost, be sincere. That when we say that we are following you, that it means we're doing our very, very best to follow you. That we desire, we want to follow you. That we want to be good examples. That we want to enter in and worship you. That we don't want to take the easy road, we want to take the right road. We want to take the path that you have set before us and we want to do as much as we can by your help, Lord, exactly what you are asking us to do. To follow your instruction. Not, try, not take so much energy to try and modify it, but rather take that energy to follow it. And God, I, I'm frustrated when I see people working so hard to try and change your commands and they take so much energy and so much time to try and rationalize and find a way to change your commands when what we really need to be doing is taking all the strength you give us so that we can follow those commands, not change them. Keep me true, Lord Jesus. Keep me true. Help me to trust you and obey and then, Lord, to invite you to cleanse me each and every day. So easily I become dirty. So easily I become covered with the world. But Jesus, I can come to you and I know, dear Lord Jesus, that you are faithful. Because I'm trying to stay clean. I'm trying not to be as the world. I'm trying to separate myself from the world to be different, to be that peculiar people. And may we all try to do that and recognize that we need your help in order to succeed. So be with us, Lord, tonight as we pray. Meet our needs and help us, dear Lord Jesus, to praise you more 
Because every day that we have victory, it's not because we are so brilliant or because I am so smart or so strong. It's because, Lord Jesus, you have stepped on the scene and given us that victory. May we praise you and thank you for that every day of our lives. I ask in Jesus' name.